Hi, I'm Steve Loftus and in this special two-part series we're going to go behind the wings of a North American long-range strategic bomber, the B-29 Superfortress. Just look at this thing, it's amazing, it's remarkable and it's enormous. This one's going to be super cool. It's the biggest, fastest, mightiest heavy bomber in the world. It can travel farther and higher than anything else on wings. We're here at the historic Lowry Air Force Base. Today it's the site of Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, but back in the 1940s and 50s it was actually a B-29 training facility and one of the first locations for aircraft-specific flight simulators. So I'm here with Chuck Stout, the curator of Wings Over the Rockies Museum. So Chuck, please could you tell us a little more about the history of the B-29 at Lowry, and in particular, what made it such a special aircraft of the time? The B-29 was the Allies' most advanced bomber in World War II. This is it. This is the B-29, the plane you've been waiting for. It could carry more, it could fly farther, and it had amazingly advanced systems for that day and age. Uh, it had pressurized areas for the crew, and it had a computerized machine gun control system. B-29s were a common sight over Denver at that time, not only coming in and out of Lowry for crew training, but Continental Airlines also had a modification center at Denver Municipal Airport. This modification center was super secret, but the fact was aviation technology was advancing so quickly that airplanes rolling off the assembly lines would be sent from the factory to one of these modification centers to get the latest and greatest technology installed before they were shipped overseas. They were building the Boeing-designed B-29 Super Fortress, and this is how they built it. They needed so many B-29s for the war effort that Boeing built them in four different factories, the main factory in Washington State, and then a large factory in Wichita, Kansas, and two others. Next stop, Wichita, Kansas. Wichita claimed the title Air Capital of the World in 1928. Throughout the years, manufacturers like Cessna, Boeing, Stearman, Mooney, Beechcraft have built over 300,000 aeroplanes in Wichita, Kansas, more than any other place on the planet. Before we take a flight in this magnificent aeroplane, let's talk some more about the history that makes it so legendary, starting in Wichita. Here we are right now in front of this magnificent aeroplane dock, and it's my great pleasure to be here with Josh. Uh, Josh, could you introduce yourself and perhaps talk a little bit about Doc's Friends? I'm Josh Wells. I'm the executive director for B-29 Doc, and uh, our mission is to let people see this airplane. We go all over the country um, and put about 100 to 120 hours on the airplane every year and, and bring it uh, to cities across the country for an up-close and personal experience with a V-29. Josh, it must have taken a huge amount of effort to get this aeroplane into the condition it's in, flyable, airworthy, usable for all the different shows that you guys uh, support. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got there? It took a team of volunteers 16 years and over 450,000 volunteer hours to put this airplane back together. It was inspected and, and taken apart and, and it was a painstaking process. Joining me right now is Mr. Tony Massolini who brainchild this is to restore the B-29 and Tony uh, just before we, we went on camera you you did mention that this has been a rather arduous uh, effort it started with a uh, a desire which uh, was an idea uh, then a desire then it became a came an obsession to do a worldwide search for uh, B-29s and uh, to restore another one back to uh, flying condition and uh, that search ended here at uh, China Lake. Uh, it started in 2000 when it arrived back here in Wichita, Kansas on seven flatbed trailers and it ended uh, with, with first flight uh, back in the air in 2016. All right, here we go. What is the special relationship Wichita and Doc have together? So Wichita, Kansas was one of the Boeing factories that built B-29s during World War II. Wichita built the most. We built 1,644 B-29s during uh, the production time during World War II here in Wichita. DOC is one of the 1,644 that was built here in Wichita. Uh, we're proud of that legacy. DOC really uh, put Wichita on the map as the air capital of the world. And so it needed to be brought back to Wichita, brought back to its home, to be restored here. The aviation knowledge, the aviation uh, workforce here is second to none. And so we're so thrilled to be able to, to showcase and tell those stories in Wichita and it for it to be a, a flying tribute to those, those young men and women who went off to, to build these airplanes and go to war. As one of 
two flying B-29s left and remaining. We are so very humbled to be able to be entrusted with this airplane, to have it restored, to be able to go tell those stories and, and continue the legacy of the B-29. With the B-29 being such a technologically advanced airplane, how did the U.S. Army Air Forces train their crews for operation? The B-29 was so packed with technological innovations that they decided that it would be much more safe and uh, economical with the airplanes needed overseas to create ground training uh, for them with simulators. So the B-29 was really the first aircraft specific flight simulators and Lowry was one of the very first places to get those flight training simulators. Flight simulators had been around for about 10 years before. Ed Link had designed the Link Trainer back in the 1930s, so they'd been around for about 10 years. But the Link Trainer was sort of a generic airplane for learning instrument flying. It didn't replicate any specific airplane. The B-29 simulators showed every knob, every button, every instrument that the pilots and crew would see in a real airplane. Yes, the B-29 is everything you've been promised. And the pilot who flies one has an enviable job. So we've learned an awful lot about Doc, Doc's history, development, his connection to Wichita. One of the things we haven't done yet is we haven't talked to the people who actually fly this bad boy. Now the moment I've been waiting for is we're going to go up and actually fly this bad boy back to Denver. So just tell me what to expect. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So we are. It's, it's an honor to have uh, Wings Over the Rockies out here with us today to travel back to Denver. Uh, I think we're going to take off here in about an hour as the, uh, the storm shift through here. And folks, I can't wait. It's, the time has come. We're going to get to go fly. So we'll open up the big hangar door. We'll uh, roll it out here on the tug and then uh, we'll go ahead and start engines. Starting engines is one of my favorite uh, pieces to watch. Just hearing those old radial engines start up. Nothing smooth about it, um, but it's a nostalgic sound. Flying dock, one of the more uh, challenging parts is the takeoff. So you have these large radial engines um, out there and what we call P-factor. So P-factor is going to try to drive that aircraft to the left as you're taking off. That clear for takeoff. So when you put those four engines forward, uh, the air airplane has a tendency to want to move to the left. So we counterbalance that by feeding in engines one and two, and then we slowly feed in three and four. Uh, so you'll, you guys will see today, the airplane, when it takes off, it'll have a tendency to shift to the left, and we'll counteract that. Uh, we don't have rudder authority uh, until we get about 80 miles an hour. So this airplane here, the only hydraulic uh, portion of the aircraft are the brakes. Everything else is uh, just uh, manual control from the throttle linkages all the way to the uh, flight controls. And then what really differentiates it from the modern day aircraft is that there's not a powered rudder back there. You're not able to actually have control authority, nose wheel steering or rudder going down the runway until that airflow deflection is, is going past the rudder. So about 80 miles an hour, the rudders become effective at that point. lift off at about 115 knots, 115 miles an hour. Uh, as you lift off, you have a tendency to uh, to want to pitch down a little bit, and that's to cool the engines. Uh, we talked a little bit ago, Steve, and uh, a tendency back in World War II were for these engines to uh, start on fire uh, frequently, and we level off on takeoff so that we can have the airflow go through the cowl flaps of the engines and to cool them down. And we still do that today. We talked about the manual controls, and it provides that mushy feeling. So you're going to see us controlling a lot, and it may be, you know, it might even look like we're over controlling the aircraft. And really, what it is is just the, the pressures of the air underneath the wing, and that are flowing over the wings. And you just have a tendency to knock down, is what we call it, knock down a wing or two to fly straight. Seven two. What's your final approach speed typically? That'd yeah, be about 140 miles an hour down funnel. Dock seven two, Roger. And dock seven two, you can make straight in for runway three five right. Straight in three five right, dock seven two. Uh, coming in to land then and to stay on final you'll just consistently knock down a wing and bring it back and um, it's a it's an absolute honor to fly it's a blast to fly uh, truly just fun all around wow so we just landed that was remarkable this piece of equipment truly is a piece of living history it's a wonderful machine and that was a bucket list item for me so thanks for watching the video we hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it and if you already subscribed, great. And if you don't, why not? Subscribe now, you'll enjoy it. <laughs>